One of the most haunting cases of all time, the mysterious death of Blair Adams sticks in the minds of many, and it may very well stay with you as well. It was only a short drive from east of Knoxville, Tennessee, where a horrifying mystery would come to light. A man known as Blair Adams was found dead near a construction site off Interstate 40. It was shocking and devastating to those who knew him, who said that he was a kind, all-around, normal guy, who often had a smile on his face and a friendly disposition. He lived in the suburbs of Surrey in Vancouver of British Columbia, Canada, and worked in construction. All accounts of Blair indicate that he was optimistic about life and good at his job, but suddenly things started to change and no one close to Blair knew why or even how to fully describe it. But one thing many knew was that the case would haunt them for the rest of their lives. Before the horrific incident in the summer of 1996, people began to realize that Blair was acting strangely. He was showing aspects of himself that no one had ever seen before. The once happy and optimistic man became abnormally paranoid. His sleeping pattern became sporadic. He was overcome with worry in a way no one had ever recognized before. His once stable demeanor was now flooded with drastic mood swings that raised much concern. He insisted that someone was out to get him, to kill him. When his mother, Sandra Edwards, asked him to talk about what was going on, he would reply by saying, I don't think I should tell you about it. Despite Sandra's efforts to find out what Blair was referring to, he refused to tell her. To this day, Sandra still has no idea what Blair meant by it. He never told her, and he never told anyone else either. It's left many mystified as they continue to search for any clues that could connect Blair's sudden, odd behavior to the tragic end of his life. Blair eventually took his odd behavior to the next level and started on a confusing and unsettling path towards his demise. On July 7th, he withdrew most of his money from his bank account and emptied his safety deposit box. He took cash, gold, jewelry, and platinum, all worth a large sum of money, and he left the place he called home. He left his family, his friends, and the job that he excelled at and loved. He was heading towards the United States for reasons unknown, but the trip would prove to be anything but simple and straightforward. He took a ferry from Victoria, British Columbia to Seattle, Washington. However, immigration officials stopped Blair. Upon checking the personal assets he had with him, they discovered a large amount of money along with other precious items. For this reason, the officials at the border believed that Blair was a possible drug courier. Running a quick background check on him, they came to find that Blair had a potentially darker past than what the public would come to know. Blair had multiple convictions on his record for assault and also for drugs. Due to this, he was denied entry into the United States. Two days later, on July 9th, the Canadian Border Patrol discovered a man attempting to cross into the United States on foot at the Pacific Highway border crossing. It was Blair. He had scratches all over his hands and legs for reasons unknown. What was even more troublesome was the fact that Blair matched the description of a man who had stolen a vehicle, and that vehicle had been found abandoned near the very place Blair was attempting to cross the Pacific Highway border crossing. But due to lack of evidence, Blair was freed from custody. The following day, Blair managed to finally cross the border to the United States with a rental vehicle, a Nissan Altima, which he obtained from the Vancouver International Airport. He would abandon the car once he arrived. 
Once he arrived in Seattle, Blair's intentions were far from coming to an end. In another sign of strange behavior, Blair purchased a round-trip ticket, but not to anywhere in the United States. He got a ticket to Frankfurt, Germany, a place where he had previously worked on a construction job. He had also dated a woman in Frankfurt, but when that woman was contacted after Blair's death, she claimed that Blair had never contacted her about visiting, so why he was heading there was still shrouded in mystery, another confusing piece of an insurmountable puzzle. But at the last minute, Blair changed his flight, and instead of heading to Frankfurt, he flew to Washington, D.C. Once there, he rented another car, a Toyota Camry, and drove to Troy, Virginia. While on Route 250 in Troy, Blair backed up his car into another man's vehicle. The accident only caused minor damage. The other motorists found Blair to be nice and courteous, however he noted that Blair seemed to be very much in a hurry. That very evening, Blair arrived in Knoxville, Tennessee, around 500 miles away from Washington, D.C. This is where his mysterious journey would come to an abrupt and dark end. Blair arrived at a gas station and told the clerk that he was having trouble with his car key, so a repair service driver named Gerald Sapp was dispatched to the gas station to assist Blair. When Gerald arrived, he noticed that while Blair was driving his rented Toyota Camry, he was attempting to open its door with the key from the Nissan Altima that he had abandoned back in Seattle. Sapp had remarked on this, stating, I asked him to look in his pockets. I said, if you drove this thing up here, you gotta have another key in your pockets. And he wouldn't look. So I thought he was nuts. He was bound and determined that he had the key he needed for that car. But because Blair couldn't find the key, Sapp called for the vehicle to be towed and dropped off at a repair shop. He then took Blair to a Fairfield Inn. Security footage from the motel lobby shows Blair waiting nearly 40 minutes before paying $100 for a room. But when the clerk was about to give Blair his change back, Blair walked away. Investigators later determined that Blair never stayed at the room he had purchased. Tragically, at 7.30 a.m. on July 11th, Blair's corpse was stumbled upon by workers in the parking lot of a hotel under construction just outside of Knoxville. His pants were missing and his shirt was open. Moreover, his pants, socks, and shoes were lying within close proximity to Blair's body. But even more perplexing was the fact that money in U.S., Canadian, and German currency was strewn around his body. But the odd findings didn't end there. A black duffel bag filled with travel receipts and maps was also recovered, as well as a fanny pack. Inside the fanny pack were gold and platinum coins, five ounces of gold bars, jewelry, sunglasses, and a pair of keys. The autopsy report stated that Blair's body was covered in scrapes and cuts, and the Sheriff's Department of Knox County suggested they were the result of a skirmish. In Blair's hand was also a long strand of black hair. Blair's body had been struck so violently that his stomach had ruptured. In addition to this, there was a wound on his forehead, which they soon learned resulted from a club or a crowbar. In the end, it was ruled that the cause of Blair's death was sepsis, which resulted from an abdominal perforation. Some believe he was sexually assaulted due to how he was partially undressed, but there is no evidence to confirm this idea. Sadly, the only tip law enforcement ever received was from two women who claimed to have seen him outside a Cracker Barrel restaurant, talking to another man whose identity is unknown. To this day, the case of Blair's downward spiral and death continue to puzzle investigators. We may never know what truly happened to him, but there's no doubt that whoever was after him is still out there, if there was anyone really after him at all.
If you have any information regarding the death of Blair Adams, you can contact the Knox County Sheriff's Department at 865-215-2444. This episode of Seriously Strange is sponsored by ExpressVPN. They're a really great service that helps to keep your online data safe. Without a virtual private network, your internet browsing data can be tracked by your ISP, your cell provider, ad companies, and hackers. When you use a VPN, however, your public IP address is masked, so even the websites that you frequently visit won't be able to identify you or target you for things you may not want. Among many other uses, ExpressVPN also helps to unblock content that's only available in some countries, allowing you to access more of the things you want to see. And you can head to expressvpn.com slash robdyke for three months free with their one-year package, and they're less than $7 a month when you continue to use them, which makes them incredibly affordable for the critical service that they offer. Just a few of the great things about ExpressVPN are that they're consistently faster than other providers, offer 24-7 support for their customers, and they have an app for every device, whether it's Windows, iOS, Android, Linux, and more. And they have browser extensions for Chrome, Firefox, so really it's a good fit for just about everybody. ExpressVPN supports an internet without restrictions, so you can securely stream or download content from anywhere, anytime. With ExpressVPN, your data is your business. ExpressVPN won't track it either. So take back your internet privacy today and stop letting your data and yourself be at risk. Head down to the description below and hit the link to expressvpn.com slash robdyke and join me in feeling a whole lot better about accessing the internet with ExpressVPN. Thanks for listening. That's all for this episode. Thank you for watching and be sure to subscribe now because you won't want to miss what's next. And I'll see you next time.